Oh, no, 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 God, you don't need this. No, 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 I want to see what that is. I think that that is what we're going to be talking about today. What is that thing that maybe we are withholding from God? And, and like I said, I think that during this time, things come to light. And maybe you've been noticing some things about yourself. You know, maybe in the beginning of coronavirus, I don't know. Let, let's say you, you have this tendency to, to, uh, uh, to really depend on other people for your sense of well-being, you know, that you really don't like being lonely. And during this time of social isolation, that has been brought out of you, right? And, and maybe th th there is that, that, that thing that, that we don't want to give to God, that we're kind of holding behind our back, that's being exposed. But the danger is that we're, we are going to hide it again. The danger is that we slip into complacency again because this is what I've learned. Uh, uh, we are going to be talking about idolatry today. But if, if, if you don't know anything about idols but just this one thing, you know, I, I would w want to just kind of give this to you, the, the, this, this little droplet of knowledge, <laughs> per, perhaps. Uh, but, but if you don't remember anything about idols, know this. Idols don't want to be found. Idols will hide, right? And we will so easily be self-deceived where we're like, God, I'm giving you everything when we're actually holding something back. Why is this important? And what might that be? That's really what this message is about and, and kind of trying to figure out, well, what is it that God really expects of us? Um, by the way, I just, I don't know, lately I've just been finding memes for the sermons, and, you know, I found this. I, I'd never seen this meme before, but I thought it was funny. Um, if I can get technology to work <laughs> to a toddler, I, or is that A or I? I? A. <laughs> Guys, I am so old. A, <laughs> what you got in your hand? <laughs> and the toddler just, like, runs away. You know, it's, it's like, it's that same idea, you know? God's saying to us, what do you have in your hand? And maybe that's a question we need to ask ourselves. What, what is that? Uh, in, in the story today, we're going to find uh, that perhaps there was something that Abraham, this guy who's uh, the friend of God, you know, who was so faithful to God in so many ways, right? Not a perfect guy, but he went to where God asked him to go. God told him that I'm going to make you the father of many nations, your descendants are going to be plentiful, right? I mean, you're not going to be able to count them. You know, more than the stars in the sky, more than sands in the seashore. But perhaps Abraham, too, had something that he would have wanted to keep for himself as well. Uh, let's go into the passage. It says, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. You know, it seems like a very faithful response. Here I am, God, what do you want of me? Ooh, it's one of those things, you know, saying here I am, God, I will do whatever you want. It's something I call a dangerous prayer. <laughs> because sometimes God will, you know, tell you something that you really don't want to hear. And this is probably one of those cases for Abraham. God says to him, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. There's a lot here, friends. So obviously, you know, God asking Abraham to sacrifice his son, right? I mean, for most people, you know, your child is like everything for a parent. You know, you hear all the time, parents, you know, would gladly give their own lives for their children. You know, there is... Uh, oftentimes for, for, for parents, nothing greater than a child. But for Abraham, it's even more than that. For Abraham, Isaac is actually the promise of God. So we talked about how, you know, there's this great promise that Abraham is going to have descendants more plentiful than, 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 you know, the sands on the shore, the stars in the sky. But remember, Abraham had to wait decades for Isaac to be born. Abraham was over 100 years old when Isaac was born, right? 
And, and it was almost like uh, there were times where Abraham and Sarah, they, they weren't even quite sure if this promise was going to come true. And Isaac's name actually means in Hebrew, laughter. And it's got a kind of a double meaning. Laughter because uh, that's what Sarah did when, when uh, uh, it was revealed that she was going to have a child. And, you know, she's like so old and she laughed. She's like, really? I'm going to have a kid? Uh, but also he's called laughter because... You know, they, he, he was such a surprise, and, and they were so joyful. And notice what God says here. He says, take your son, your only son, right? You only have one son, Isaac. It's not like there's other children that can fulfill this promise. He's only got one at this point, right? He is the sole heir, the sole uh, 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 hope of this promise that Abraham and Sarah have. But he also says, whom you love. Oh, God, now it just seems like you're rubbing it in, you know? But I think this is important. Because I think, what, if you kind of read between the lines here, I think God sees something in Abraham. He's like, yeah, I know you love this kid. You love this kid so much. I mean, it's almost like, can you imagine like someone who, who like didn't think they could have kids? They've been praying for decades for a child. And, and just so many sleepless nights, so many uh, nights full of tears, praying for this child. And that child finally comes. And can you imagine what that child's going to be like? Just, I mean, the, the, the parents are going to wrap that kid in bubble wrap, you know? They're going to be like, dude, you, you can't, you know, coronavirus, like, Six feet away, 60 feet away, okay? You're wearing a mask all the time. You're never going outside. You're going to be so protective of that kid. That kid's going to be everything to you. And can you imagine what it was like for Abraham? Right? After all of this time, he has his son. And he loves his son. But this is the thing. Abraham got this great gift. And it's from God. And it's a fulfillment of a promise. But did you know that even something good like a son or godly like a promise can become an idol so one of the things that that uh, um, i've learned from uh, tim keller who talks a lot about idolatry is that one of the misconceptions we have about idols is that we think idols are something bad right and and for, for us we don't really understand uh, idolatry um, in modern times or at least don't have a, a, a you know very clear language for it because to us an idol is like taking a carven image or something or you know bowing down to some you know statue or sculpture or something like that you know and we don't really do that you know it doesn't feel like we're, we're worshiping you know uh, like, like you would worship to a god or giving sacrifices or you know burning things or whatever um, but w what Tim Keller says is that Idol uh, idols can be almost anything. And for most of us, idols are actually good. They're good things. But the problem with an idol is not that it's bad, but it's a good thing that is given a status that it should not have. It's a good thing that is elevated to an ultimate thing or to a supreme thing, right? So Isaac is good, right? Having a son is good. The fulfillment of the promise is good. But maybe what, what, what we see in this, take your son, your only son whom you love, is that perhaps Abraham has elevated Isaac to a level that's even above God. Right? What do I need God for? Now I have a son. I have the fulfillment of the promise. And now that I have that, now Isaac is everything. Right? And, and obviously... <laughs> You know, with the example of like, like you know, let's say there's a miracle kid and, and the, the parents like wrap that kid in bubble wrap and whatever. Actually, in many ways, that can be very destructive, right? Because Abraham, well, you know, Isaac is not God. Isaac cannot be God, right? To put all those hopes on Isaac, I mean, you know, sometimes you see this. Like parents, they love their kids so much. Their, their kids are everything to them. And it actually has a way of embittering those kids, Right? Like, like there's so much pressure put on them, you know? Like, oh, you have to fulfill the promise that God gave me. It's like, oh my gosh, 
You know, I'm just a kid. I just want to have fun. You know, I want to screw up and whatever. You can't screw up. You have to be perfect. You know, what happens if you take something that is not supposed to be used in this way and you make it greater than it's supposed to be? I just, this was not originally a part of the sermon, but I just got this (laughs) silly image. You ever see like uh, uh, Little Mermaid? You know, like the Dinglehopper? You know, where like, like Ariel takes these things that, you know, <laughs> they kind of like look like they can fill that purpose, like a fork kind of looks like it, 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 it's a comb, but, but it's not really, you know? And it's weird when, when she takes the, the fork and she's like styling her hair with it, you know? Or you take the pipe and it kind of looks like a musical instrument and you blow it out and the soot flies everywhere, you know? And there's something about taking something that was not meant to uh, fulfill that purpose and, and giving it the wrong purpose. It's off. It's wrong. And those things will, well, I mean, you know, everyone's going to be harmed by that in some ways. I mean, poor Dinklehopper, right? Poor, poor Pipe, you know? They, they weren't meant to be used in that way. People were not meant to be used in that way. You know, and idols, things that are very good, are not meant to be gods. And so, you see this test, and, and you know this part we kind of skipped over when we were reading it earlier, so let's take a look at this. Verse 3, Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. I wanted to highlight that because I want you to see how painful this probably was. Abraham. It's not like God was like, I I know the way we read it, it was almost like God's like, okay, take your son, you know, go sacrifice him. And then the next scene, you see Abraham and he puts Isaac on the, the, the kind of, you know, the wood pile and he's ready to go. That's not what happens. There's three days that pass on the third day, right? So two full days is the third day. He's going up on the mountain and he's had two full days to think about this. Two full days to walk with his son, whom he loves, who he knows that he's been called to sacrifice. Oh, it's heart-wrenching stuff, right? Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Now, I don't know what's going on here because obviously, you know, what you get the sense is that Abraham was not traveling alone. He had his son, and there were other people who came with him, right? just makes sense. You make a long journey. You have other people with you if you can, right? Safety in numbers. Um, but, at, you know, at the point where he's going to have to do the deed, he's like, yeah, you guys stay back, right? But he tells them, we're going to go over there. We're going to worship, and then we will come back. So there's a couple ways to look at this. Is Abraham lying? The, 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 or, you know, is he like, oh, hey, don't worry about it, you know? He's like, he doesn't want them to suspect anything. Or does Abraham really believe that they're going to come back? Now, Abraham is willing to go through with it. It says, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. And so they went, both of them, together. And um, by the way, you know, uh, sometimes people do point out that Abraham took the wood and put it on his son as they marched up a hill. There's going to be another uh, example of a son, an only son, carrying wood, going up a hill. Just, you know, if you don't get it, just, you know, it's Jesus. Spoiler alert. <laughs> but, but anyways, so, so you, you, you got them. They're going up the mountain together, right? And then you, you have this other scene that, that, that is very, very, uh, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's rough. Uh, I, I'm, uh, just there's no other way to put it. They went, both of them together, and Isaac said to his father, my father, And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? 
And Abraham said, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So, in the Hebrew, there's no commas. It's kind of a double meaning, really. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. Son, you're the burnt offering. The thing that we have to remember, because it's so easy to skip to the end of the story and say, well, Abraham didn't have to go through with it. God gave Isaac back to him, and he does. But Abraham is completely willing to go through with it. Why? I mean, isn't Isaac the fulfillment of the promise? And by the way, I think when Abraham says to the, the, the servants, hey, we're just going to go over there, we're going to go worship, and we'll come back. I think he means it. I think he means it. We're going to go worship God, and then we will come back. Abraham doesn't know how it's going to happen but he believes that the Lord will provide. Now, God has done all these things. He's seen the faithfulness of God. Could it be that Abraham believes that even if he sacrifices Isaac, that God, in all of his power, can actually bring Isaac back from the dead? I don't know. He doesn't know how it's going to happen, but he does know that the Lord will be faithful. He trusts that. And he puts his trust so completely in God that he's willing to do something that seems insane, insane to you or I, right? But at the same time, Abraham's also right on this account. He is going to worship. Because what is worship? Worship is saying true things about God. God is God. God is great, right? Making God God as he should be, that is worship. But what has Abraham done? You know, maybe unwittingly, I mean, what parent doesn't do this at some point? He has perhaps elevated Isaac above God. And what he is going to do is going to worship God to put God in his rightful place. And in many ways to remove Isaac from the altar of his heart. Right? And so that's what happens. Abraham reached out his hand, verse 10. Uh, sorry, let's go there. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. He's ready to do it. He's ready to do it. He's got the knife up. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Again, that's submission. And he said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son your only son from me. Now I know that you fear God. We use the word fear, um, and, and for many of us, it's like a negative, right? Like, why fear God? It says in Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And in many ways, two great themes of the Old Testament that get repeated again and again and again are two themes that perhaps many of us don't really understand and we don't like. <laughs> we don't really talk about a lot. And maybe this is part of the reason why so many of us struggle with the Old Testament. And those two themes are idolatry and the fear of the Lord. It just repeats itself again and again and again. Right? Now, is fear kind of like the cowering, um, the kind of like, like, run away, run away? Well, sometimes. But what, what the fear of the Lord really is about is putting God in his proper place. Right? That, that there are people who are afraid of God because they know how awesome and powerful he is, how holy he is, how even being in the presence of a, a holy God like this that we being sinful as we are, that our lives would be forfeit. 
and, and, and that, that the people who really come to know God and trust God also fear him. They also respect him, right? So maybe for some of you, you're like, wait, 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 wait. But Pastor Steve, you're talking about fear of the Lord. But at the same time, you know, isn't God love, right? And doesn't perfect love drive out fear? And isn't Jesus all about love? And, and yes, yes, he, he is. But there is one fear that can never fully go away. All the other fears should go away. But there's one fear that shouldn't, and it's the fear of the Lord, right? Because God stands above. And what we end up doing is we look at um, our lives and we, we, we kind of like take the things that we desire and we put limits on God. We're like, well, I fear nothing. Well, God is love. Right? I like that part. So I'm going to take that and I'm going to elevate that above all others. There's no elevating above God. That's what the fear of God is about. You cannot get higher than God. We do not get to decide that. We do not get to put anything above God, even a concept that is godly like love. And so in, in doing that, in putting God first, There is a way in which our lives are made right. Remember, we talked about righteousness. And righteousness, you know, last week we talked about obedience, right? But why does Abraham obey God? Is it just because he wants things from him? It's also because he knows that God is God. God is in the proper place in Abraham's relationship, right? But there was one time where this started changing, where Abraham started elevating something above God. He started loving something more than God. He started trusting something more than God. And that was with his son Isaac. And so that's what this test is about. Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Now, you might remember. Remember what Isaac said to Abraham? You know, he's like, okay, where's the offering? Where's the offering? What did Isaac say? He's like, where's the lamb? He thought they were going to sacrifice a lamb. But here we find a ram is caught in the thicket. Where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? <laughs> in many ways, we believe that the lamb was coming later. So one of the things that you may have seen is that um, there's a, another father who has an only son. And it, it is the most famous uh, scripture in, in, in the, the entire Bible. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Romans 8.32. 32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? This is what Tim Keller writes about this uh, in Counterfeit Gods. He, he says that God saw Abraham's sacrifice and said, now I know that you love me because you did not withhold your only son from me. But how much more can we look at his sacrifice on the cross and say to God, now we know that you love us, for you did not withhold your son, your only son, whom you love from us. When the magnitude of what he did dawns on us, it makes it possible finally to rest our hearts in him rather than in anything else. God is an awesome God. God is a God who is worthy to be feared and respected. But God is a loving God. God is a merciful God. 
And we know God as love because we know that we do not deserve it. I mean, from the very beginning of the story, you may be troubled. You're like, well, God, why would you ask for Abraham's firstborn? There's this idea of the debt of the firstborn that runs throughout Scripture. And the idea is this. Because we are sinful people, our lives are forfeit. This is something that the people of Israel understood. God can and deserves to punish us, even to wipe us out if he so wishes. He created us. We've rebelled from God. And so if God wants to take a flood and wipe out the people, it is within God's rights and within God's justice to do so. That's something that we don't really understand anymore. We have elevated love, and we have elevated this idea that we are so loved that we're like, God, you could never do that to us. But it's actually the reverse. God could. God could destroy us. God could punish us. God could take anything from us. And he would be well within his rights to do that. But the fact that instead of doing that, not only does he give Isaac back to Abraham, but he provides the lamb. And the lamb is not Abraham's only son. It's God's only son. And we don't get to the mercy, the love, the grace of God and come to be in awe of it and worship it until you go through the fear of God and understanding how holy he is and how completely mind-boggling it is that God would flip that and so graciously give to us what we do not deserve. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? God is a given God. He is worthy of everything. But we, so often, are not given people. We don't understand this kind of grace. And so we become very stingy. We live in a world where we're very tight-fisted because oftentimes we think it depends on us. On what circumstance would Abraham be like, no, no, there's no way I'm giving you Isaac. No way, no way. You know in what world that would be? If God wasn't really God. If God couldn't really deliver on promises. If God couldn't perform miracles if God wasn't the creator of the heavens of the earth, and if all we had was what we saw, all Abraham had was his son, by some miracle we had Isaac, great, and now we're going to hold on to him, and we are not going to let go because this is all we have. So you're putting all your eggs in this basket. You're trusting in this above all else, right? And that's how we form idols. You don't need to believe in a God to have an idol. In fact, some of the, 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 the most gripping idols are ones that exist in a world where we don't believe in a God. Because then we think what we have is all we have. Hey, if I don't have my money, then what's going to happen to me? If I don't have my nest egg and something bad happens, then I'm ruined. That's it. We live in this world that suddenly becomes really scary and really uncertain. And so what we try to find is we try to find a little life preserver. We try to find a little spot of land that we can uh, uh, perch ourselves on and say, okay, now I'm safe. And this is how we create so many idols, right? We find these things, money, success, whatever it may be, and, and we try to make this thing the thing that will save us, the thing that will make us secure. And brothers and sisters, remember, Idols do not want to be found, but make no mistake, we all have them. So I, I want to ask you, how do we identify an idol? And so I want to propose a few things. Some of this comes from the book Counterfeit God. Some of this is uh, things that I've probably gotten from other sources. Uh, they're definitely not original thoughts. Uh, but can we just go up a little bit? It's uh, identifying an idol. Sorry, this thing keeps, okay, there we go. Okay, I identifying an idol. So. Uh, number one and number two are kind of related. If you didn't have this thing, right, this thing that might be an idol, uh, 
you would despair. You would feel like life was severely diminished or not worth living. Uh, and then the second one is kind of like it. Not having it makes you angry, desperate, or restless. So uh, during the, the, the financial crisis uh, uh, of mid-2008, um, there are a lot of people who uh, were like you know, money managers or high-level executives um, who, uh, you know, when all things kind of went down and, and a lot of money was lost and, you know, uh, 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 yeah, just there was this financial ruin that was uh, uh, something we hadn't seen since the Great Depression. There was a string of suicides of a lot of these high-up people. Why? Could it be that money and what we think money can do for us can be an idol? I, I honestly think it's probably the biggest idol of America. It's probably the thing that we worship more than anything. Um, they have this saying for elections, uh, it's the economy stupid, right? Um, whether right or wrong, uh, almost always you can actually chart American history and politics. And if there's an incumbent president, you can know based on one thing whether or not that person's gonna get reelected. You know what it is? It's the economy, that's it. You, you can literally look at all these incumbent presidents. If the economy is doing well, they tend to get reelected, almost always. If the economy is not doing well, they don't. It's almost like nothing else matters, right? I mean, I, I don't wanna get too political, but sometimes when you hear people talk about Politicians, it's like people are willing to look past everything else, everything else. Oh, but there's a good economy. Could it be that money can be an idol? Um, Tim Keller in the book Counterfeit Gods was, uh, he talked about how he gave this uh, a series of talks. And Tim Keller is a very you know, famous pastor and you know, pe people love to see him speak. And he gave this series of talks on the seven deadly sins. And uh, uh, when he got to the greed one, his wife was like, I bet you anything that this is going to be the lowest attended talk of all the other ones, uh, you know, of, of all the talks that you give in this series. And, and Tim Keller says, she was right. <laughs> you know, lust, bunch of, du bunch of dudes came for lust, you know. Uh, but a bunch of people came for all the other ones. But greed, almost no one. The American church, we talk about all this stuff all these great sins. But how often do you really hear people talk about greed? Almost no one. Idols do not want to be found. But when you lose money, when money's on the line, does your life fall apart? That's the question. Not having it makes you angry, desperate, or restless. For me, one of the, the idols for me, and you know, I don't really know how to put this. <laughs> I was kind of thinking about like, like, what's the idol here? Um, but I think I've made an idol of people's approval, wanting people to like me. So are people the idol or is the approval? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but as a pastor, man, you know, if I preach a sermon and I feel like it tanked, I feel like, like, you know, I didn't do a good job or people didn't like it. Or if someone like messages me and is like very critical of the message, it ruins me. I can't stop thinking about it, right? I mean, it, like my whole week will be off. There are many times, I, I'm being honest, in LGM, I felt like the message didn't go well. And, you know, I'll finish, I'll pray, praise team's up here, and I'm over here, right, while the praise team is doing the closing song and I can't even worship. I can't worship because I'm so ruined by this idea that I didn't do a good job. Maybe people wouldn't like it. Is that not an idol? It occupies your thoughts, daydreams, your hopes and dreams. So again, it could be a thought as in a negative thought, the worry cycle, but also it becomes the thing that you put your hopes on. Right? So on the flip side, let's say I preach a really good sermon, you know, and then I'm like, I feel like I'm on top of the world, just, yeah, you know, it's like the best feeling, you know. Have you ever seen, like, uh, one of these um, uh, game shows, like uh, The Wall? 
and, and the wall is this show where you can win like millions of dollars, like, like this little um, like digital hockey puck thing, it falls and you could you ha have one dollar or you could have a million dollars. And when you see it fall in the million versus the one, right? What are people's reaction? Are they like, huh, money's just an object, it's just a tool. You know what? To God alone be the glory. You know, like money comes and goes, no big deal. When it falls on the million, ah, you've never seen so much joy, right? It's like the greatest thing. They're crying. They're hugging the host who they don't even know uncomfortably, right? And if it falls on, now, by the way, like, like the way that the game works is that if you get the question wrong, they ask like a trivial question. If you get it right, it's green. And then, you know, whatever money amount it falls on, you get that money. But if you get it wrong, it turns red. And whatever amount it falls on, you lose. So you could be up $500,000, be like, my life is going to change. Everything's going to get better. But then you get the question wrong and it's red. And when it falls on that million, what happens to that person? What happens to that person? By the way, that money wasn't real. <laughs> you know, they're on a game show. You know, it, it doesn't become real until afterwards and they write the check, right? But it's almost like their lives are ruined. Do we think, do we put our hopes and dreams on this thing? We think this thing is going to make our lives better. Now, money is an obvious one, but it could be relationships. It could be the next Avengers movie. It could be these things that we think are going to make everything better. The Lakers winning the championship or the Lakers losing the championship. I don't know <laughs> that you think that it's all going to get better if this thing happens. So you think having it will make you happy, fulfilled, or complete? And you have come to trust it for your security and your well-being. I, I, I want to read this, and I highlighted it, because it's something we've read before, but we, we don't, I, I'm not sure that we fully believe Matthew 6, uh, 24. Um, by the way, it's not showing up on my laptop, so I'm going to have to look it up here real quick. Matthew 6, 24. It says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve. You cannot worship. You cannot live for both. One is going to rule, and one is going to be subservient. Right? And I think most people... Are, are, are under the impression that, like, well, yeah, okay, God's, God's important and money's important, and I can have them both kind of on the same level. Or we give lip service to the fact that, that we think that God is greater. Remember, no one thinks they have an idol. Nobody. Because that's what idols do. Idols, they lodge them, themselves in their hearts, and they don't want to be found because they want to be in charge. They want to kind of rule from the background. Right? And in some ways, if you identified it, you're like, yeah, money is my idol, and you want to follow God, then you'd probably have to do something about it. So most of us are delusional about this. But make no mistake, you cannot serve two masters. Right? And by the way, money is not bad. None of these things are bad. Right? But it's about... Do these things have the proper relationship in our life? Are they in the proper place? Or we have, or have we elevated certain things to be greater than they are supposed to be? And so, brothers and sisters, the, the, uh, another problem is, is the way that we started uh, uh, th this, this uh, message when we talked about the idea of like, Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul, I live for you alone, right? So if, if we want this, and we're like, God, you know, you are everything, right? And this is a beautiful thing, because you are giving to God everything, but also in this, God gives to you everything as well, right? Don't we see that, right? For he who did not withhold his own son, how will he not also with him give us all things, right? God wants to give you everything, 
himself. Is there anything greater? But the problem of coming in without giving him empty hands is that God cannot give you everything, right? If your hands are already clutched to an idol, then you cannot have God, not fully. This is why you cannot serve God and any other master, right? Because if you want to receive fully from God, you have to have empty hands. You got to come empty-handed. And so, brothers and sisters, that's what we're hoping to do. How do we do this? Now, there may be times where literally we are called to give something up. You know, um, it could be something like money. Now, this is not popular, and you never hear people preach about this or really talk about this anymore, but people used to take vows of poverty. Did you know that? St. Francis of Assisi, who a lot of us esteem very greatly, he was very rich. He came from a very rich family. And he went to follow the Lord, and he took a vow of poverty. This is why Franciscans, um, they, they don't wear a belt. They just have a brown robe, and that's it. It was very common that you would have a robe, uh, you would have a belt to, you know, hold everything together, keep it tight so, you know, robes aren't flapping in the breeze. But Franciscans don't wear be- uh, r- ropes around their waist, or, and, or th- sorry, they don't have a belt, because um, belts were used to hold money. You know, you have a little money purse there. And it was their way of saying, we have nothing. We have given up everything to follow God. Now, maybe we're not there. <laughs> and I'm not saying that God is telling you to do that. But I, I, I'm reminded of the story with uh, Rich Stearns in, in a book called uh, The Hole in Our Gospel, which talks about sort of how we've kind of dropped the ball when it comes to um, uh, helping the world with poverty. And we're such a rich country. And, and one of the things that he was talking about is during, uh, I think it was during the, the, the recession of uh, 2008, um, he was the, the, the CEO of a large company, and um, he was really, really worried about what was going to happen and about money. And he was just so preoccupied with it, he couldn't sleep. And uh, just he and his wife, they were like, yo, we're, we're, we're so bothered by this. And so what they decided to do in faith, it was the last thing they felt like doing. They decided to write a check, to give. Now, they didn't give everything, but they gave in a way where it wasn't convenient for them. It wasn't something they felt like doing. But they felt like, you know, this money, this, 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 idea that, that, you know, our lives are going to be ruined because of this recession or, you know, we've come to depend on this too much. This has become an idol and we have to give it up. And in faith, they gave, right? Maybe some of us, time has become an idol. You, you think your time has become so precious and, and you can't give it to anyone, right? And we become so stingy with it. I have to have my time. I have to have my time. It's one of the idols for me, if I'm being really honest. And one of the things I've learned to do is to give up time, right? Give up time for family, for church, but give up time for God. Every day I spend, you know, about 20 minutes in prayer just doing nothing, just being in the presence of God. God, I will give it up, right? But even if it's something like... um, my idol that I've made of the approval of people. You know, I I don't want to say there's an easy fix for things like that. And maybe for you, whatever your idol may be, whatever the thing that you've come to depend on, maybe it's something that practically, right now, you can't completely, like, actually physically give it up. You know, like, like, well, you know, I I, got to stay in this job, or I'm called to this job, or, you know, I can't leave my family, you know? But one thing that we can do I think, is to acknowledge it before God. Because in a lot of ways, it is not necessarily having the thing that's bad, because the thing is not bad. It's the role that it's taking in your heart. And being able to acknowledge that, not hide from it, not letting it control your life in the background, but confessing that continually before God. God, I know this thing has become too big. And Lord, you can have that. You can have it. You can have it all. 
even acknowledging that in your prayer life, I think is a way to desire to come empty-handed. Praise team, can you come up? I want to teach you real quick, as the praise team is coming up, a prayer that I've learned from Richard Foster. And it's a very simple prayer. Hands down, hands up. That's it. That's the prayer, right? And what hands down is, is that surrender. To say, God, you can have everything, right? Good and bad, whatever it may be, I just lay it down before you. You don't even need to list all those things, but symbolically, in your heart, to make that your desire. God, I want to give you all things, right? And then the second part is the one we really like. It's hands up. Hands up is receiving. Receiving from God. Coming to God empty-handed, right? And so now we can receive all the things from God. All all of his, his blessings, his Holy Spirit right? All the good things that God has for us. But brothers and sisters, make no mistake. God's blessings are plentiful. They're good. They're bountiful. God wants to give them to you. I know that's the part we like to focus on. Yeah, God bless me. Yeah, God give me more. But we can't receive it when our hands are full. So first, we need to put our hands down. We need to surrender. We need to lay down all the things that we hold on to too tight, all the things that we have come to depend on, we we, we thought would save us, make our lives better, make us secure. Brothers and sisters, can you do that just in faith? Maybe there's something God is putting on your heart. You want to name that thing. You know, maybe there will be a step down the line. Don't, don't, Don't fast forward past this moment. Maybe God will ask you to do something. But right now, All we want to do is to just dislodge it from your heart by naming it. It it doesn't want to go into the light. It wants to stay hidden. And if it stays hidden, then it thinks it won't be found out. But if you could at least name it, if you could at least bring it into the light, say, God, my desire is to live for you and you alone. So God, I just want to name This thing has become too big in my life. I've come to rely on it too much for my security, for my happiness, for my hopes and my dreams. When I think I I won't get it, it makes me too upset. God, I just confess this before you. Can you do that in faith, brothers and sisters? We just give you a moment to do that. Just in faith, like maybe you don't even know what that thing is, but you have this desire give your whole life to God. Can you just put your hands down in faith? Just make that your prayer. You can pray that dangerous but wonderful, life-giving, freeing prayer. God, what is it? What is my Isaac? What is the thing I'm holding on to tightly? Now in faith, brothers and sisters, can you put your hands up? Put your palms up? This is a posture of receiving, right? As if rain were pouring from the heavens. As if a heavenly pinata split open (laughs) and all the goodies are coming out. I mean, is is it too much? Is it embarrassing to think of God in that way that he would want to shower blessings on you? Why? God is a good God. He's a loving God. He does want you to have good things. He just knows that there's nothing greater than him. And so we want to receive those things, but in God's perfect order, right? So as we desire to give up those things of of ourselves and those things that we've relied on too much, we want to receive God, His Holy Spirit. We want to receive the goodness that comes from Him. So let's take a moment, palms up, just in faith, and just receive. You don't even need to say anything. Just take a moment. To just receive, to, to be silent in faith, even if you don't feel anything, to know that God is a God of blessing. He wants to give of you, to give to you of Himself, His Holy Spirit. Receive it, friends.
Precious God, what freedom we have in Jesus. What freedom we have. That you are such a given God. You gave Jesus for us to be the lamb that pays the debt for our sin so we can be free. God, may we never be in, uh, enslaved to anything other than to your will, other than to the goodness and, 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 and the, the wholeness of all your purposes for us. God, to that we want to be beholden and nothing else. And so, God, we lay down our crowns, we lay down our securities, we lay down our, our desire for power and money and security. We lay down every other idol. And, God, we say, we want to have nothing but you. Be our God. Be our master. Give us true freedom in this life and beyond. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.